welcome to the From Survivor to Thriver podcast. I'm Mark Fernandes. Each week, along with my co-host Eric DeRosa, we aim to shatter the stigma around mental health conversations through kitchen table conversations with real and relatable people. All the while, reminding our audience that they are not alone. There is hope, there is help, and there is a way through. Enjoy today's episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to From Survivor Thriver, episode 150. It's like a nice round number. Not going to say much about it beyond that. But this is one of your co-hosts, Mark Fernandes. I'm, I'm just further down the creek. I'm a little down valley today from a remote location, and I'm going to send it back up valley across Brush Creek to my ever hot, steamy co-host, Eric DeRosa. Oh, our Happy 2024. This is our first recording of the new year, and I have, uh, right before we came on, I jotted it down in my legal pad. I said 2024 is the year of the Thriver. And so I don't know how I'm going to market that, where where it's going to show up on our From Survivor to Thriver merch and all those things, but 2024 is definitely the year of the Thriver. I think all of us have had enough surviving in our lives, and so I think it's time for us to move on. How are things with you? I know you're a little bit down the creek where the actual Roaring Fork is running and not frozen this time of year. It's not fully frozen, but it's icier than you would think after the past couple of full days. I'm good. It's been a wild week. We don't have to go too deep into it, but my uh, my wife's office was burglarized and kind of pulling ourselves out of that and trying to set everything uh, back the way it needs to be has been sort of insane but big shout out to snowmass village police uh person has already been apprehended all of the things have been recovered but we can't have them back because they're evidence <laughs> so it's been only- <laughs> well we talked this weekend when the dust has settled i'm so sorry to hear that and i hope she gets her things back very quickly we're, we're doing all right we're doing it. i'm oh. excited to do it. it's, it's been a while since we've reported so i know so for our first guest for 2024, I'm super excited. We're going north of the border to meet, I'm going to say, not only a, a really good friend, uh, but somebody who, if if I could call her a little sister, I would. She's amazing. I've been on her show, and I thought she was the right person to have on to kick off the new year. So joining us today is Nikki Lacroce. In early 2021, Nikki experienced what she now refers to as her, and I quote, personal Armageddon as she left a decade-long abusive relationship and simultaneously was faced with the unexpected loss of her mother amidst the peak of the pandemic. Navigating these events and being forced to cope with two very different types of grief at once, Nikki's perspective on mental health, personal growth, and healing through trauma shifted drastically. She has always felt strongly about the importance of human connection, and thanks to a tremendous amount of support from her family, friends, and her therapist, she made the decision, and I'm so glad she did, to return to the mic to share her own story in May of 2022. Now, you can catch new episodes of Who the Fuck every week to hear guests from all over the globe share their unique stories of resilience, gratitude, and their missions to make meaningful change in the world. Nikki sees the continued growth of her show as a way to help others feel seen and heard so they can learn how to prioritize their well-being and find the inner peace we all deserve. With that, let's go up to British Columbia to welcome in my friend and little sister, Nikki. Thank you so much, Eric. I love the introduction and I totally feel the same way. The connection was, I feel virtually instant. You're one of those people that since meeting, I kind of just don't even know what my life was before we met. Like you've just always now been part of my life. I appreciate that. And yeah, getting your random texts or me sending you random texts and whether it's just something a little bit uplifting or business related, you have been an incredible addition to my chosen family. Uh, as Mark and I like to refer to it as. And uh, and I want to thank you for that. And for those who are listening right now, when the audio clips come out, you'll see I was gifted 
over the holidays, an amazing beanie for the cold weather here from the Who the Fuck podcast. And so I'm donning it on tonight's show. And to any of our other upcoming guests, if you yourself have any merch and you want to send it our way, Mark and I are more than happy to wear it during the recording and a great way to plug your own show and what you're doing. So thank you so much. Yeah. I was really just hoping you'd wear it out on the slopes and and get some good use out of it. So I appreciate the product placement. (laughs) So I guess to start, there are so many pieces and parts. And you and Mark and I were all on this, I'll call it a crusade, if you will. (laughs) Yes, that's a great. To shatter all these stigmas. And there are so many stigmas to shatter. And there are so many things that we could talk about. Uh, But I think a great place to sort of pick it up and we can always backtrack from there, is when you were talking about 2021 and your own personal Armageddon. And not too long after that, when you finally came out and spoke about what was happening in your life, it was really a game changer, I know, for you. So if you want, take us kind of from that point and what was happening, and and then we can always fill in some of the pieces and parts later on. Sure. So it's really interesting to be at this point in my life and thinking about it now because it was so intense as it was happening that it was one of those moments in your life where you maybe feel a little bit like, how does my life go from here? or Where does it go from here? What is the right or best path forward? And I think sometimes it can be so disorienting when you have a lot happening at the same time, especially when it's a lot of very traumatic things happening at the same time. So as you mentioned, one of the biggest things, and this is something that I'm really Uh, going to be intentional about emphasizing more with my show is the extreme importance of having a support system that is both strong and sustainable and made up of varied people with different experiences who can kind of step in at the right points in time. And Eric, you and I obviously had spoken about that quite a bit when you were on my show. And I think that when I was in that situation. So the over decade long abusive relationship was with my ex who I ended up having married, but there was something in me the whole time that I like knew this person wasn't right for me. But what I came to realize really by the time that I had left and kind of working through it, especially because I was also navigating the grief of losing my mom, was that there was this part of me that really needed to understand and heal what part of me accepted it for so long. Because being in an abusive relationship, it was primarily psychologically abusive with somebody who is narcissistic. But It was something that, you know, I didn't understand that my lack of self-love was a major contributing factor in keeping me there. It's not at all my intention to ever victim blame or shame somebody. I think there is a sense of accountability that I am trying to take now or I'm taking now to take ownership of my part in that. Because if I could have understood even before deciding to marry this person, even before deciding to continue to date this person after a handful of dates... If I could really have placed in my mind and heart why it is that I truly want to be with this person, the answer would have been because I want somebody to love me, because I want somebody to want to be with me. There were not a lot of specific answers to the questions of what do I want? What do I need? What are my deal breakers? I was just so desperate to have the type of love that I really wanted that I sort of did mental gymnastics to believe that the situation that I was in could provide that, even though in retrospect, looking back on it, that is so unbelievably inaccurate. And it's almost a little hard to kind of look at with that type of examination because it's like, gosh, it seems so obvious. And so many people would say to me, well, you were so close to it. You couldn't see it while you were in it. And you're like, oh. But all the signs pointed to this wasn't good or these bad things were happening. And so because I was at this major point of transition, both in leaving that relationship and then suddenly losing my mom, it kind of felt like I just didn't have a choice like, or that the choice was being thrust upon me that like, if you're not going to change now, <laughs> when the hell are you going to change? And so I think getting to that place of recognition where There were no excuses to be made. There was nothing that could keep me there. It really shed a light on my own responsibility that I had to take for why I accepted so little for so long. So hearing all that, first off, it takes a ton of courage to even turn your gaze inward that way. But what do you think led you to understanding? We 
But fortunately, we talk too often about how you even sort of make an allusion to this of like, you kind of need to be smacked in the face, with, right? We don't come to conclusions sort of easily. And what do you think? And, and I think of this not only, you know, from our own perspective as someone going through it, but as someone who may have a loved one going through it, or you see this happening to someone in a relationship. And it's funny to say it this way, but I almost think of like, where's that entry point where you could see something like that and say, hey, by the way, Nick, I think you might deserve better than so even <laughs> perspective of a loved one who's watching from the outside or, of course, take it from your own perspective of what were some of those things that you kind of drove right past? And Yeah, yeah. that's a, a good way of putting it. Things that I drove right past. The analogy that I like to give is that when you watch dogs doing agility training and they're dodging all of those flags, it's like those were all the red flags and I just fucking ignored every single one of them. <laughs> nope, nope. And I'm like, meanwhile, I'm like, I'm winning. And it's like, you're really not. You're dancing um, around them. Like, have you ever seen that? Like, dance? What, what was that video game with the math? Like, Dance Dance Revolution or whatever? Oh, yeah. yes. Totally. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. You and you're like, Woo. Yeah. So I'll address both of the things that you said. First, I will say that after I left my ex, one of the common pieces of feedback that I heard from my friends and family was that they didn't know what to say. Or should they, could they have said something more that would have influenced me to leave sooner because they could see it? And my response to them was always, I wasn't going, nothing you said would have changed it. Unfortunately, I think as somebody who was in it and how long I suffered through it, I wish that I could have absorbed that in a way where I was receptive and actually made the change and be like, yes, you know what? You're freaking right. I should leave. Whatever. Bye. But it took a lot of repeated conversations with many different people saying essentially the same thing in a variety of ways. And there is one moment that I can point to that is sort of the pinnacle of all of it, which was one of my best friends, Paula, saying to me, you're asking for the bare minimum and you're not even getting that. And I was like, okay. If it had come on its own and there weren't all the other inputs, maybe it wouldn't have hit the way that it did. It's still a very strong statement and it's completely accurate. So I think it was the culmination of I don't believe I alienated people and kind of iced them out from giving me the feedback. I found myself being more defensive of my ex, trying to justify the things that she was doing. She was dealing with a very substantial substance abuse problem, claiming that she was dealing with dissociative identity disorder. And then there was a therapist involved who was validating her, who was ethically unsound for a variety of reasons that I don't need to get into. But Suffice to say that it was like that idea of being too close to it, I kind of felt upset with myself at first. But now that I look back, I'm like, well, all the inputs from the people closest to me, like literally in proximity to me, were the ones that were being manipulative, whereas the ones that were more external and literally physically much further away from me were kind of coming in at random and based on what limited information I was sharing. So with nobody really knowing the whole story, it would have been really hard for them to be able to influence me in a way that would have propelled me out of that relationship faster. But that said, I was gaslit a lot. When I started dating my ex, it was 2009 or 2010. And I don't believe that the term gaslighting was really out there at all the way that it is now. And so I kind of feel like if it were as mainstream back then, maybe I would have picked up on it sooner because there were a lot of situations that even now as I'm talking about it, this is my whole like feeling of what happens in therapy. I'm like, well, I feel it in my body. It like gives me like that ick feeling of like, oh God, like I that feeling of being lied to, that feeling of being told that something is true when I'm like looking at the evidence that it's straight up not possible to be true. And so those constant feelings of like, am I crazy? I feel insane. Well, what's really interesting is that during this time, and I'm not a big journaler like with notebooks, but I do write down my thoughts a lot just sporadically online, like on my notes or whatever. And even in email communications I had with my ex that I found recently is me trying to explain myself, things that I'm insecure about or asking questions about things that don't make sense. And I'm literally now over a decade later, witness to the actual gaslighting in raw format, like, oh, my God, 
I couldn't see it. I was in it and I couldn't see it. And so I think in some ways, while it's really disturbing to actually know that as the version of me now that can see it, it is also somehow healing to be witness to like, I didn't know what I didn't know. I'm so how could I have left sooner? And I'm curious as so as you go back and you were reading that, did it feel like you were reading somebody else's story as though somebody else had written a short story or a, a little novel and you were flipping through it and reading about this character and right the character's partner and thinking, wow, this is like this relationship is destined to fail. How could these p- two people stay together? <laughs> Yeah. Well, first of all, the two people shouldn't have even honestly probably gotten past a first date. So that was like a lot of my insecurity factoring into that. I don't know if I saw it as objectively as you're describing, but I do feel like there was this very definitive sense of, wow, I can't believe that was my life. Like, I can't believe that was who I was. So in that way, Eric, I think like sort of that objectivity is there, but it's looking at my yeah, I mean, not much, much younger self, but a significantly younger version of myself, seeing sort of the lack of understanding, seeing the insecurity, the willing to, I don't even want to say compromise, but the willing to abandon myself to try to keep this person around. When in reality, it's like, if I really understood the concept of self-abandonment at the time, then it would have been very clear to me that I shouldn't be with this person. So I think now I look at it, I'm like, you're abandoning yourself. You abandon yourself there. You acquiesced here. You let her gaslight you in these moments because it was easier than having to deal with the confrontation. And so it's more like I feel sorry for my younger self for not knowing better, for being stuck in that, for feeling like very caged by a, a tremendously difficult situation with somebody who, by the way, was eight, almost nine years older than me, who like At the time, because I was in my early 20s when we met, I perceived this person as like they know better, they're older, they're wiser, whatever. And it's interesting because this might not feel totally relevant, but I'm going to say it anyway, is there was something I saw online the other day that was like, if you're not sure if you're with the right person, ask yourself if you'd want to be more like them and then you have your answer. And I was like. (laughs) <laughs> well, why didn't tell anybody tell me to ask that question so mark to answer your question if somebody had said that maybe i would have gotten there faster well, I mean, and that's the hard thing right you never know what to say and you know the one thing i will say to you though is i don't think it is just a question of question of age because all too often when i've heard people talk about being in an abusive relationship no matter what kind of abuse it is it's actually it's more an understanding of that situation versus having some sort of sage wisdom. That you yeah, yeah. Come out with. But, but the thing that you speak to that I think is so vital and it is also so hugely useful is this understanding of like what position you are with yourself. Eric and I have shared our journeys and in different ways, especially with our Amy's, both of our wives. And we were both actually by our generation quite young uh, when we got married. But the thing, notwithstanding some of our different um, mental health issues, the two things that I could answer that question very easily is that both of us would easily would love to be a little bit more like our spouses in a lot of ways, because they're both amazing humans. A lot of ways. (laughs) And a lot of ways. And the other bit of it that I find so compelling and I want to talk more about is this idea of understanding yourself and your needs and how you're fulfilling those for yourself and then how the partner is. It's all too often that you see an abusive relationship. There's codependency. There's interdependency. There's all these different sort of like odd bits that fall into it. I'm watching you grimace and nod. So I'm pushing into the right place here. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And I think no matter your age, it's very easy to fall into those habits with someone who, for whatever reason you've decided, has trust and you believe that like they are for your benefit. That's what they're there for. And I would just love to hear a little bit more about your journey of realizing that understanding who you are as a person and, and this idea of self-abandonment and how you develop into the better version of a human you are, it, 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 it can absolutely be aided by another person, but can also be a hundred times hindered. Yes, I have many thoughts on what you just said. Let's see. So 
I agree with you. The age thing may or may not be relevant. I think it was more like I I was so young in that like I had just graduated college. I hadn't really had any other dating experiences outside of my ex. So because I wasn't really dating anybody in the same age range as myself, we weren't experiencing life sort of at the same pace, which I think made a difference, right? There was a lot of conversation about how she had already been through these things and did she want to go through them again with me because I'm at this younger age. So it's always kind of like the power dynamic of I'm older, you're younger. There was also See, that your point. Different. So that's the yeah. point, right? Where if the power dynamic is different, the, the age if you're experiencing this together, that you already got othered there. So it didn't matter. Actually. Yeah, that's a really good point, Mark. Yeah. And so I think the part that for me especially was really critical and it's it i'm glad that you said codependence because that's when i started to to make the face that you mentioned i literally just talked to my therapist about this today because i have a a friend who was a podcast guest who introduced me to the podcaster mark groves who was really instrumental in kind of making it click in my brain because my therapist recommended this episode that he recorded with his guest terry cole And they were talking about codependency. And my therapist recommending that to me was so pivotal because I think what happened in that moment, and we both talked about this literally today, so talk about divine timing, was that we remember me sitting in her office and her telling me to listen to this episode. It was recognition that codependence is not just somebody taking all the time, which was sort of my perspective on it. I felt like my partner might have been codependent because I felt like I was being run ragged by them. But it was like I willfully gave it. I gave. And when I did try to set a boundary or ask for what I needed, if it was shut down, then I just was like, okay, well, any little bit that you'll give me, any scrap that you'll give me will be good enough. And it's like, I don't want to be starving in a relationship. I want to be like a freaking feast. You know, I want to feel like there is an abundance of opportunity to show up for one another or share in the relationship together. And it was just so definitively one sided that I didn't understand how much I contributed to that codependency. So that for me was just such a massive turning point to be able to understand, oh, it's not just that she is the way that she is and she's abusing the situation in her own way, but it's that I'm allowing it to happen. And I say allowing with sort of the caveat of when you're in a psychologically abusive relationship, You make a lot of concessions because you don't want to deal with all of the backlash of whatever it is that you're going to get when you try to set a boundary. And something else that has come into my life very recently, I think it was Jay Shetty's podcast where he mentioned something about how not just having a boundary and setting that boundary, because we then put the onus on somebody else, like you have to respect it, but it's also our responsibility to uphold that boundary. And I was terrible at upholding the boundaries. I let those walls crumble as soon as I felt like there was a risk of losing this person. And in retrospect, I'm like, should have let the walls crumble. Like it would have been actually a lot better sooner. Now that said, to kind of bring it into your comment around things that you see in your partners and your amies that you both love and that you would, that you appreciate and that you respect and that as an individual, if you see that and it would be great to be able to emulate that or have part of that within your own personality, I see and feel that so deeply with my partner, Nicole. And that's where even just in my own self-awareness, once I was out of that situation, I looked back, I'm like, I didn't even respect her. And I was certainly not respected by her. So it's like, I gave so many, I think it was like this idea that I was just, I was such a hopeless romantic growing up. And so I just like loved love so much that I really wanted somebody to love me because I knew how much I could love. And so when somebody allowed me to, I was like, here, take it all because you want it. Right. And it's like, but you have to also know that somebody's going to respect that and guard that and feel gratitude for that. And I that was a big part of what was missing. And it took me arguably far too long, in my own opinion, to realize that. But the thing that I think is really important to mention related to my story is that because there was a lot of substance abuse that I was unaware of, there was very much like a double life that was happening that was unbeknownst to me. And so not only am I being gaslit, but I also am living sort of an alternative reality to what's actually happening. 
And so I think I was like in a constant state of disorientation. If I left and went out of town, something would happen at home, guaranteed. I was living in a perpetual state of waiting for the other shoe to drop. And it's really hard to come to a place of reason and rationale when you're in literally just hypervigilance all the time. And that's part of the manipulation, right? Is like, make it so you're unstable so you can't see clearly what's happening to you. And it's like, being away from that and looking at it now, oh gosh, I that the only thing I can keep saying is I wish I knew more sooner about just the psychology behind it because even just learning to understand that outside of who I am as a person was so important to then giving me the space to s- sort of reflect on it and be like, oh, how does that actually affect me? How's that showing up in my life? I'm sure you danced around many hard red flags besides this one, but when I hear that idea of hypervigilance around either a parent or a partner or someone who is like so clearly supposed to be in your corner. Like to me, that is like you, you've flown the entire UN of red flags. Like there's 30 of them all lined up in a row. Well, and, and, and I'll, and I say this honestly, just knowing from some of my own family experience, life experiences, if you're hypervigilant around the person who is most supposed to be in your corner, you, you're, you're beginning in a place where there's no, like you can't fight that out of that paper bag. There's no way that's happening. Especially yeah, for sure. Out of from a codependency standpoint, what you talked about is beautiful. This idea of like codependency is both allowed and forced bits of it, but it it is like the harbinger of dangerous codependency that if you have removed yourself even the slightest bit and place just goes on fire immediately, then there's something wrong, right? That person is not able to exist in some sort of a healthy continuum without you. And you won't be able yeah. to exist healthily together then. It just won't happen. That's a really good point. I appreciate that you you made that point as well, because it was so frequent. I mean, there was not a year that went by. I, I think by the time we were divorced, it was 12 years that we'd been together. But it was like there was not a year that had gone by where there wasn't some sort of like at the very least mildly traumatic event. And in the worst case scenario, it's incredibly traumatic and more like surreal than I could even describe events that shook my world in ways that fundamentally changed the way that I show up as a human being. So it was like, this this idea that I could somehow help was also really pivotal in like why I stayed because she had the story of past traumas, past sexual assaults, like things that had happened and absolutely used that, unfortunately. And here's the thing. There's I don't know for sure what is factual and what is not. I believe that at least some part of it is based on what I understood to be true. But I also believe that there was a lot of lying to a degree where I will never know how much is or was actually something that occurred. And because of that, it really strained my sense of like, I just couldn't feel safe ever because I she had cheated on me in the first year that we were together with her ex. And that was something that I was really worried about. And I had actually said to her, I wouldn't be with somebody if they cheated on me. And then that happened. I stayed. And then it was it, it almost feels like as I look at it in the rearview mirror, like that was the test. It was like if if you said you wouldn't stay and now you are staying so I can pretty much do whatever I want. And that's the way the next 10 years of our relationship went. And when I really think about the uneven distribution of commitment to the relationship, it's shocking to see it now. If I really split it up and was like, this is what I contributed not just in material ways, but like emotionally, psychologically, whatever, versus the other side. It's like, give me a break. That's not healthy in any way, shape or form. So, yeah, I think that there's a lot that sort of can be examined in this through this lens of much greater awareness now having been through it. But it's so hard when you're sifting through it at the time to make sense of it. And to your point, like because you don't have that safety and without that safety, you can't really have the clarity. And something that my therapist had actually said to me after I'd left was that she had observed that a lot of times when I would make the point that this was the last straw, something traumatic would happen again. And not just kind of, it would be like increasingly traumatic things were happening. So it was like she was becoming more aware that I was becoming more aware that I needed to leave the situation. And so now things are getting worse and worse. And I'm feeling more and more like I can't leave, even though everything inside of me is like, get the hell out of there. It's such a 
amazing story. And you, and you and I have talked about so many pieces and parts of it. And But to hear the whole thing laid out like that, I'm sorry you had to go through that. But in many ways, I know this from you as the person you are today. You are s- such a stronger person. So as, as you talked about, your self-esteem, <laughs> it's 180 degrees in the other direction. Yeah, I appreciate it. You and I could talk about imposter syndrome at another time because <laughs> we often do. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm in like a pretty good place with that right oh, now. Oh, good, so I good. Feel like I'm, I'm good. So I'm bearing, take I'm bearing it, I'm bearing it for all this. So something I wanted to do was not for all of us. I was going to say, I'd love to hear how you're doing on that because I still. Oh, I'm terrible <laughs> on it. So uh, right now, what I wanted to do is go back more in time and then so that we could go yeah. forward to to present. My brain works in weird sorts of ways. And I hearing self-esteem, low self-esteem come up, fear, safety, right? I know for me, I often used to talk about codependency and then I realized it was actually anxious attachment syndrome and learning Mm -hmm. all of those differences. Uh, How much of that low self-esteem and that fear and holding on to that relationship Do you think goes back to the younger Nikki trying to figure out who you actually were, right? And I'm watching you smile. And I know you know that I'm coming. Like, were you in my therapy therapy session? No, and I know you know I'm coming at that from like more than just one angle, right? It's not only is it figuring out like, who we are, you, sexuality, everything for you at a younger age, right? All those questions were floating around in your mind. And so I'm curious how much of that was a setup for what was to come for you later on. Yeah, I love the way that you just teed that up. So legit was just walking through this because I was feeling really stuck. This is why I said I felt like I was doing a little bit better in regards to the imposter syndrome side of things. It may or may not be true. I'm not sure yet. It, I feel like I'm like making my way out of it and I'm sure it'll resurface at points in times. But because I'd actually been struggling the last few weeks kind of being like, I know that what I'm doing with the podcast and putting my story and helping other people put their stories out there is so important. But there's something that I physically felt was blocking me, like some sort of emotional thing that just felt like a wall was actually up in my body from allowing me to just like let it happen and be what I needed it to be. And so I ended up talking to my wife about it a little bit and then going to lunch with one of my friends. And coming out of that, I decided I was going to listen to this TED talk about self-doubt and about like probably like seven minutes in or something, I just had something in my brain click and started just talking into my notes app so I could remember what I was thinking. And it brought me to this place that really helped me recognize sort of the multifaceted reasons that I think I held on to a lot of insecurity and self-doubt. And I'm working through that now. And I'll start by saying, growing up, I got made fun of a bit. When I was younger, I had short hair. So I mean, I have short hair now, but like there was a period of time where I tried to fit in and I did. I had like long hair and I looked, I was straight passing for sure. Also like making out with guys probably made it seem pretty straight passing as well. (laughs) So I definitely thought the bulk of it was the lingering insecurity of being made fun of, as you said earlier on, Mark, being othered. Like I didn't look the way other people looked or maybe behave the way that other people behaved. And so that was hard for me. And to compound it, it, Eric, I think the, the thing that I had shared with you was around kind of losing my core group of girlfriends um, when I was 12 or 13 when I was in seventh grade because they thought I was a lesbian, which just like shoved me so far back into that closet. I was like, I have a boyfriend all the time. Um, And this fear of just really being alienated and ousted from a social group at what is such a pivotal point where like literally our brains think at those ages that like the most important thing is that you belong somewhere. The most important thing is that you have community and support in that way. And so while I still had friends, it was like they touched on this part that I was absolutely not ready to expose. To be honest, didn't even really, I don't want to say didn't know because I feel like I've known since I was nine, but it was like I hadn't really allowed myself to entertain the idea of it being reality because that was, I guess, in like the late 90s. 
So I wasn't going to like put myself out there and be that vulnerable to being ostracized because clearly just even in a microcosm, it was it, it could happen. And so I, I feel like that was a big part of it. And I think that so much of why I've felt anxiety about showing up or shame about like really being who I am has been around, OK, well, what will people think or will they not like me if I show up for who I truly am? recognizing that I've worked through a lot of that stuff now. I mean, it's still unfortunate. And again, I feel bad for my younger self that like I had to go through that. But the other day, I actually really realized that there is this part of me that was holding on to shame and fear and guilt associated with the way that my parents approached like giving me like, let's say, reprimanding me in public if they were like they very reactive like I'm a reactive person Nicole and I have very different conflict styles she's more avoidant I'm more reactive we have to like we're in a constant state of working on that especially because I have ADHD that wasn't diagnosed when I was a kid my parents didn't understand I I certainly didn't understand that like the impulsivity kind of comes with it and so a lot of times if I was reactive they would be like go to your room and the only way I knew how to self-soothe or regulate my emotions was to basically nap and then be like ready to apologize for whatever I did and If I was in public, I don't think that it was the intention, but it is how I felt was that if I'm getting snapped at by my parents or reprimanded for something in front of people, then now I have a ton of internalized shame, anxiety of what other people think, the perceptions, et cetera. Even talking about it right now, because it's like a very freshly uncovered thing, like within the last 48 hours is sort of intense because When I started going to therapy and diving into things from my childhood and having to acknowledge my parents, the way that they handled these things contributed to this. My parents, there was never a doubt in my mind that they loved me. There's never been a doubt in my mind that they're proud of me. But there have been moments where I've worried, especially related to my sexuality, if they accepted me. And there are moments where I truly have felt just sort of that, even as an adult, had that ongoing sort of shame of not wanting to like reveal too much or have too big of a reaction with them and interestingly so right before my mom passed away about two weeks before she passed away I saw her in person and she had said to me because at this point I made the decision to leave my ex she's I don't understand why you felt like you couldn't talk to us about these things and it's like because I had a genuine fear of how you responded to things and I was in a place where I could finally communicate that but it's something that I really wish she was still here to talk through a little bit more. But I think that even just having the ability to recognize that and be like, oh, it really isn't just the bullying. Because I really up until no joke 48 hours ago was like, it's because I was bullied and I have this insecurity and I need to just get over it. Like I I have, to your point, Eric, much more self-confidence now. So why am I still so insecure about showing up? Like, what is that? I was like, come on, I'm flipping over rocks. And I'm like, is it that? And finally, I just sort of stopped trying to find it. And something clicked and then I was like wait a second oh no okay I guess we have to deal with that now and so I'm kind of mid-flight on that journey at this point and it's definitely it's eye-opening because I give my parents a lot of credit for what they did well and I also have to say that there are things that I wish they knew how to do better I love how you put that and something was kind of those light bulb moments chandelier moments when they all go off you're talking you're mid-flight hopefully on your plane the the door plug doesn't come flying out <laughs> as it did on the alaska airlines flight i joke of course but when i last went through like my major flipping over rocks and then suddenly there was this big boulder that started rolling after me and when it tipped over there was all this stuff underneath and i realized oh i have to like plow through this and I didn't want to. And I remember our therapist, Mark and I share a therapist. She said, you should be thanking your brain right now because this is your brain's way of telling you that you're ready to do the next piece of really hard work. And at the time, Mm -hmm. it made no sense to me. At the time, I didn't want to hear it. I just was thinking, I can't believe I'm going through this again. But when I came out the other side, there were all these additional things that had been so unsolved for decades that were suddenly solved. And so many things started to make sense. And I came down from 36,000 feet and I touched down on the runway, a few bumps along the way. 
but it sounds very much as though that's kind of where you are in your in your journey right now. Yeah, I really appreciate you adding to the analogy with you're flipping over these rocks and now this boulder's coming after you because it's interesting that there's something that can be so influential in the way that we show up and the way that we behave and what we allow to surface that are just not at the forefront. So it, it's like a very, in a way, it's a humbling experience to just how much can go on without you really understanding what it is. But like you said, I do feel like it's because I'm at this point where I am ready to to be able to navigate it. And based on everything I was telling you before, which believe me is the short version, it's like there was no space for me to access that. There couldn't have been because I was so preoccupied with all the other stuff going on in my life. And it, forget the insanity of the relationship, a bit like losing my mom and the fact that I was going through a really bad divorce because my ex was relentless, literally was lost my mom and would not like give me any sort of like break with the divorce. Like she could have just taken 50 percent, walked away and it would have been like nothing by good congratulations. But instead, it was like I now had to battle somebody instead of allowing myself to grieve the loss of my mom. So it was like as long as that was happening, I wasn't able to fully process losing my mom. My family struggled with that as well. And then once that had all sort of passed and then I was able to more appropriately dedicate time to grieving the loss of my mom. Now I'm in a place where it's like, okay, what about the other stuff? Right. Like Because there was a lot of other stuff, to your point, Eric, that happened way before any of that that contributed to me getting to that place ultimately. And I could not have grasped the level of growth that I have gone through without having experienced those things. And I always say to people, I wouldn't if somebody was like, you you wouldn't have this growth if you didn't go through these things. I'm not the person that wants to be like, okay, I'd do it again because I don't know that I want to. But I do recognize the impact that those experiences had on my both desire and the necessity to grow at the kind of honestly rapid and aggressive like rate that I needed to be able to like actually launch myself into the next version of my life, which happened really quickly once those two sort of massive hurdles were cleared. Hence me being in Canada now, because I, I don't think that really was on my radar at all. But, you know, I do believe that sometimes like the right people come into your life at the right time. And my wife, Nicole, came in as a friend and um, was exactly the support that I needed at the time when I needed it. And, you know, when it comes to thinking about my previous habits and relationships and holding on to that shame and that low self-esteem, like I wasn't in that place at all when I met Nicole. And she was actually wanting to commit to a relationship. And she said previously, like, she just didn't really care. She was uninvested. And so when two people are sort of at that right point in their life, like, I would have been the desperate needy one previously. And she would have been like, that's gross. I don't want to date that. So I'm glad for the growth that I, I went through to be able to be where I am and to be able to, like, have the people in my life now that I do who create such a safe space and so much opportunity to, like, really show up fully and ask myself those deeper questions that are still lingering. Well, it's the hardest thing, right? I, I won't say we often celebrate our journeys, but like we wear them as a badge, so to speak, or they're whatever they are. But the three of us wouldn't be sitting here having these very open and raw conversations about how hard it is just to be a person in the world sometimes. And I don't say that to minimize anything. I say that to like maximize the, the just human characteristics of what we all often do, right? Even the way you spoke about your parents, like, and regret's the wrong word, but you know, feeling like you've lost out of being able to like share this next part of the journey with your mother. Most parents, no matter withstanding like different mistakes they made or whatever, they were doing the best they could and they would continue. Right. So, and as somebody who's lost a parent as well, I would, I would just tell you that whatever spiritual belief or whatever it is, like it's there. And there's still such a part of that journey for the good and the, all those things happen. And it, it is, but it is such a strong and strange, difficulty when you have one of those things and like i'll have that random thought occasionally where i really want to call my dad generally it's actually one of the few times that i'll journal and write that because i'm like mm -hmm. it's that important to me it's, it's the time that i know that i should take note of it however i do and and it also helps me 
sort of, for lack of better terms, digest that thought process and and put it in as part of how I breathe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And something that I do feel is so much more important is to get those feelings out when you have them. It's sort of how I actually ended up coming back to the mic was I just knew I needed to process what I was going through, but I didn't. I felt like if I sat in front of a computer and I tried to write it out or I'm very bad at writing by hand because I have terrible handwriting and I can't write fast enough with my how quickly my brain works. So I'm like, I'm going to just start thinking about how I'm writing it and I'm not just going to write. So I just threw on my headphones, hit record on my mixer and was like, okay, whatever comes out. And if I want to do something with it, I will. And if I don't, I won't. And it was really freeing to just be able to say it. Just put it out there and release it in some way because it is very different when you're sharing your story with somebody versus just sort of letting it flow out of you without it needing to be in any particular direction. And what you mentioned about writing something particularly if it comes up as it relates to your dad, I've written my mom letters and things like that since losing her, things that I want her to know or how I'm feeling and what you've just sort of spurred in me is this thought around like, Those can also be things that are maybe more related to what I wish I could talk to her about now in in this growth journey that I'm on. Things that maybe if she were here, she'd be like, I don't really want to talk about that. (laughs) We're not having that discussion. So I I, a place now where you could drive the bus right through that, right? You're like, well, mom, (laughs) I kind of need to talk about this. So if I better write this letter, that's what I'm going to do. But if you were sitting here. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I think unfortunately or fortunately for my dad, he's kind of getting the brunt of that. It's like, well, she's not here, so now you're gonna hear it all. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> you're just yeah, yeah, riding along as I'm going on this emotional journey. So thanks for your presence. But yeah, it does, I think, benefit us a lot, whether it's speaking it out loud, putting it in a voice memo on your phone, writing it down somewhere to give yourself that space to, like you said, digest it, to process it, to give it oxygen so that you can kind of release it from just your body and holding on to it because I know for myself it's that feeling of strain of like there's like I said it just felt like something was literally blocking me I was like it's weird like I can't shake it out I can't work it out I can't figure out what it is like how to release it and then all of a sudden it was like this seemingly arbitrary moment just was like it's gone I was like oh cool that was helpful (laughs) So one of the things I wanted to do is use some of our remaining time. I know you and I have talked about this, Nikki, off camera. And I think we might have even talked to it a little bit on on mic and camera when I was on your show. But having you on, you're a public voice, a powerful voice. A lot of people hear what you say, listen to what you say. And being an ally, an advocate, and part of the LGBTQ community One of the things I've been thinking about a lot in a relation to the conversation you and I had a while back is this idea of the intersection of mental health, physical health, and the LGBTQ community. And you and I were talking about, and Mark and I have talked with some other guests about this idea of there's a struggle at some point when you're trying to figure out, do I come out? How do I come out? What do I say? Where do I fit in? And there's a big mental health struggle often that is associated with it. Sometimes there's an addiction struggle as well. At some point, we come out, we talk, you're accepted or not accepted, depending on who it is that you're talking to. But that also opens up a different can of worms, which in unfortunately in today's society is around physical health and physical safety. And what I fear... and and I'd love to get your thoughts on this, is people in the LGBTQ community who are finally comfortable to come out and be who they truly are, who are now fearing for their physical safety and what that's potentially doing as like an add-on to people's mental health issues, right? It's almost like in this exponential effect. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it and your advice to people who might be listening and thinking, do I come out? If I do, who do I talk to? And how do I go about doing that? Ooh, that feels like. (laughs) 
I am not a professional. No, nope. um, you're not from a professional standpoint at all. Because for your own lived experience, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have one of them for you. <laughs> this is my disclaimer. So, okay, there were a couple of questions there. One, I will say that so growing up when I did, like, I'm an elder millennial, so I know that it's strange right now because there's this. So when I was growing up. Like I said, I kind of had this situation where I was ousted for my friend group in the late 90s when I was around like 12 or 13. And at that time and even through high school and honestly, even through college, so like probably like mid 90s through early 2000s, people weren't really out as boldly as they are now. And I mean that in the way of like you see young teens, I mean, kids younger than teens, but people in middle school, high school coming out and being comfortable with it and showing up and being like, this is who I am. I'm okay with that. I envy that. I think it's beautiful. I think it's amazing that you can go to prom with somebody of your gender. That would have been amazing to to know that you. I felt safe in something like that. But at the time, it's like we had a gay straight alliance at the school. That's what they called it. And it was like there were maybe four people in it, somebody who was very obviously gay. And then the girls, you're like, they could be lesbians. Maybe. I don't know. And bisexuality was still like very much like pick one. And so at this point, or at that point, it was like, you're not going to put yourself in that situation. It sort of reminds me of the movie Mean Girls when they're like, that's social suicide. Yes. And it's like, that's what it would feel like. And not to make light of suicide at all. So that's it. Lisa Sugarman was in my brain at that moment. And by the way, she says hi. I uh, love Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that said, I think that when I did make the choice to really come out to my family and friends, it was hard because I think with coming out, my friend Dustin and I did an episode of this on the first season of my show, is you're sort of in this perpetual state of coming out because anytime you meet somebody, it's sort of like you're straight and less stated otherwise. And so I think part of it is when you're coming out to somebody, it's really important to know that you're in a safe environment, emotionally safe, first and foremost. And it can be hard because you might feel like you have to tiptoe around it. The benefit, I think, younger people or even older people, who cares what age they are, coming out today is that I think that it is much more well-received at a broader scale because I think it's more mainstream. There's a lot more representation. There's a lot more conversation about it. However, the reason I sort of stumbled through the first part of what I was trying to figure out how to say this was because there seems to be a broader sense of acceptance, but there's also now this uptick in really aggressive violence that wasn't really happening the same way then. I do think part of that is generally the state of the world. I think there is way too much like there's way too much violence at large. And the fact that people can point to a specific group, whether that's the queer community, whether that's racial communities or whatever it is like people are just going to pick they're going to other and they're going to point their ire at that group and do whatever they feel they need to do to have some sense of control which is completely unnecessary anyway so i say all of that to try to make the point that it's important to know that who you are should not be stifled by the way somebody else feels about it but the fear of retaliation in some way is very real. And it's important to know as much as you can, if you are concerned about coming out, whether it's your sexuality or if you're trans or something along those lines, that you have some general gauge of the person that you're with and their sense of acceptance of it. And it's like, I don't even want to release that word because I don't, it's unfortunate that we're in this situation, but I don't know that I have any profound advice other than try to surround yourself with loving people that you won't question if their love for you is conditional or unconditional. It's it can be really challenging. My parents weren't immediately comfortable and that took some years and lots of conversations and verbal knockdown drag out fights about it. But I think at the end of the day, most people just want to see the people in their life that they care about be happy. And something that my friend Dustin did say to me in the episode that we recorded that really helped me in releasing some of the anger with my own parents was I had really known since I was nine 
I finally acknowledged and came to terms with it in like my late teens, early 20s, where I was like, okay, this is who I am. And I'm not going to like have one foot in and one foot out. I'm going to just tell people. And my parents didn't know any of that. So like, I do think it's important to give a little bit of grace to the people around you, provided that they're not trying to harm you or they're not trying to tell you that you are not who you say you are. So I think it's really about standing firm in your understanding of yourself, trying to give grace to those who might need a little bit of time to process it because you've known longer than they have, and ultimately making sure that if you do feel unsafe in a situation, that first of all, if it needs to be reported because it's that extreme, absolutely report it. But if it's something where like you just need to remove yourself from the situation and maybe not be around those people anymore and you have that choice, then you will meet people who are the right people to be in your life. If somebody's going to isolate you or alienate you or condemn you for being who you are, they're not your people. And as hard as that might be to accept when you're feeling the hurt of that, the reality is that it's not your responsibility how they react. Your responsibility is to yourself and to be honest with yourself. And the only way you're going to live a happy, fulfilling life is to stand in your truth. The only thing I'll disagree with you on that is you said that wasn't the problem. <laughs> it was well, and, yes and it was yeah, beautifully you know, put it was beautifully put and i'll be honest is it speaks to the realities of not only the person who's coming out but you know your thoughts and, and talking about the situation the audience the people and giving people grace of no matter how obvious it may seem to you at that time the other person through their own lived experience it could feel blindsided or whatever it is mm-hmm. And I think there, I think there needs to be, and it's one of the things I sort of congratulate the younger generations at, but at times it goes a little too far of like, yes, we're going to accept this. We're going to do this. It's like, that that doesn't mean that it won't take some time or adjustment on the part of the other person. And that doesn't mean they don't love you. It doesn't mean that they don't care for you. What it actually could mean is it just takes them a little time to like wrap their minds around it or to be like, I embrace this person as who they are, but now I don't know that there's been something I didn't know. And now like they're going to question themselves too and be like, why didn't I know? Why didn't they tell me? Story? Why didn't I figure it out? Mm-hmm. Are there other things I don't know that I should know or should have known? Right. And I think it's not fair to just um, automatically assume like, all right, I'm going to make this statement. I'm going to do this and everything's just going to be hunky dory. And it doesn't mean it won't. And it doesn't mean it doesn't come from love. And, and I think that's such that is a hugely profound and very important uh, bit of that, that I've very hardly, I've very rarely heard it said so well. I really thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you for that feedback, too. And you're right. I do think part of what I admire about younger generations is their openness, is their desire for that really kind of ultimate acceptance. And it's as somebody who's, like I said, an elder millennial, and I think you guys are Gen X, right? Yeah. So, Proud Gen X. It's so, yeah. <laughs> so it's like looking at my parents and them being like, okay, well, why can't they just get on board with like the way that I am and what I believe and what I think? Well, probably the same reason their parents could, couldn't get on board with the, the way that they were and the way that they thought. And so it's like, I understand the frustration of younger generations with us as older generations being like, why can't you just get on board with it already? Right. Because of course it's, it's because We've adapted to accept things for the way that they are, whether that's good, bad or indifferent. We've just sort of gotten used to it. So this is what we're familiar with. And so to your point, Mark, I think sometimes it absolutely might feel that sense of being blindsided. But it could also just be like, I just need to like reorient myself with the situation more than anything. It's just like, oh, okay, that's new information. Now that I know that this can be how I behave or how I think of things. And that's how I I think what you're referring to is really being willing to be open minded and be willing to change the way that you see the world or the way that you think about things. There's no harm in evolving in that way. Like we are human beings. We are built to evolve. That means physically. That means mentally. That means emotionally. And so if it's challenging, I think the thing that I would invite somebody who is on the receiving end of information that might feel disorienting for them is ask yourself why to be able to understand how you can come at it from a different angle thousand percent and i think what you just said that i love so much is that is part of evolution right so if you're someone who's listening to this right now and you're like okay old fogies over there like just get (laughs) the program 
we are doing everything we can to get with the program, right? But we've got all this programming and things that we're trying to sort out. And we're also trying to be respectful, right? Like, I'm going to give you a very funny anecdote about when my wife and I were living in New York, we weren't married yet. And one of her cousins, we're very close with, would never refer to us as boyfriend and girlfriend because she thought it was demeaning to the depth and what she thought of our relationship. So whenever she was introducing Amy and I wasn't there, we'd be like, oh, and Amy's partner will be here later or whatever. And I walked into a room one day and the whole place, and the woman standing next to me was like, are you Amy's partner? And I was like, yeah. And they kind of looked at me and they were like, we were expecting a girl, right? She kept calling the partner. And like, so we just assumed and, and it led to this like uproarious laughter. And to be honest, like it was a room full of like therapists, you know, college professors. It, it, it was a very accepting, very like, there was a very like, they were just like, we were expecting a girl. And I you were like, I, you don't seem like you're a lesbian. Yeah, I love like, women. You could okay. <laughs> But no, so th there was this very, but it actually, it, it made me think of it when you said that of like the reorientation, right? Like nowadays we refer to anyone in some kind of partnership, you would use that as a partner. But in mm -hmm. 2001, New York City, that, that they just, and, and it actually, it kind of flips out at its end because they immediately assumed since my cousin kept referring to us as partners, that it, it absolutely like Amy's a lesbian and we're waiting for her girlfriend to get here. And then a bearded dude rolls in, dropping F-bombs and they're like, that's not what we expect. <laughs> They're like, we had totally, we were totally on board with it. Where is her lesbian girlfriend? <laughs> we were actually looking forward to another girl in the group. Yeah, right. We're like, this is unsatisfying. <laughs> but, but it led to me, it, just as you were even saying that, this idea of like how we reorient or think about it, it actually like sparked that story in my head immediately because I was like, that also shows a need or a want to not only be accepted, but to accept, right? Like we, we get, mm. especially if you think about it, if it's someone you truly love and care about, like you said, in the long run, their happiness and healthiness is what really matters. And, right. and I think if you do have questions about something like this, it's really hard to do that, but you're going to have to go down that road of like, this person I'm about to go talk to, am I telling them for me? Or am I telling them so it could be the next step in our relationship together that they'll understand this broader part of me and i think if you can't answer yes to that second question then maybe you do have to think about whether it's the right time how it's done and things like that for sure and something I, I love that you shared that story thank you because it really painted a picture in my head of what the look on people's faces would be <laughs> and i i feel like the other thing that's important to acknowledge there is that desire that we do have to exhibit our acceptance to other people when we know that we are accepting. And I think that can be hard sometimes because we are in this state of hyper awareness about like, are we saying the right things? Am I communicating what I think in a way that's not offensive to somebody? Sometimes not. Sometimes we'll say it wrong or sometimes we don't know better. But the whole idea of when you know better, do better, that has to sort of be our collective philosophy to be able to navigate these changes that are happening. I mean, this isn't the first time in like all of human history that social changes have happened like this. It's been consistent progression. So I feel like it's important for us to acknowledge that this is happening now. It will continue to happen. And the more open minded that we can be, the better off we'll all be, because I don't really feel like there's any benefit to hating somebody for any reason, really, but specifically for something that you th this is somebody's humanity. It is their story of themselves. Like it's nobody else's decision to make who each of us are. So why does there need to be any animosity about that? And I just really encourage people to invite the conversations that might feel uncomfortable in because it's can be challenging and it can be maybe embarrassing to admit that you don't know things, especially a terminology or specific, I don't know, ideologies or whatever it might be. But if you don't ask, you're never going to know. So you may as well have the conversations. And it's not to say you have to agree with everything, but wouldn't it at least be nice to know what you, why you believe what you believe? Well, and I think in addition to that, and I can't think of a better way to wrap up because the way you said that is so beautiful and it's so true. And I think the other sensitivity to it, if you are, especially if you're in one of the younger generations, talk to one of the older ones, these changes have actually been on fast forward since the 60s. And just like I think about my mom who was born in 1957, 
and what she has seen either she got in trouble in middle school for wearing pants as a girl right like i think people need a little perspective in that right and like i i've been very open about the fact that i had i had a gay catholic bunk uncle and an auntie roger and like my upbringing was very mixed culturally and i grew up in a very old world household but like all different races and different things around me and yeah. having a gay uncle and being catholic and all these things but like it's been on fast forward like and if you can eric's a little over 50 i'm approaching 50 like our past 12 years it's been like a blur of like oh wait oh we don't use what, that term is bad now like i i thought that was the nicer one so like a little grace and acceptance and maybe instead of just getting offended and angry like ask someone a question of like what is it that you think about that or why and you might both end up learning something instead of getting totally i feel like it always ends up in this like preach learn lecture situation that won't help us all in the long run it just won't i don't think yeah and we're not it doesn't always have to be a discussion where you're trying to impose something on somebody i think that's one of the most comedic things about people who are against like the queer community is like nobody is trying to make you gay here like that's like not even remotely in fact you're so opposed to it that like i d i would prefer it if that's not the case because that just seems like bad juju i can it's fine you stay where you are but i think the case right the person who's most specifically against it is because they're struggling with it themselves Yep. Well, and how beautiful would it be if the people that really are so feeling like they they need to condemn it so much because they're loathing part of themselves or insecure about part of themselves, like could feel that sense of community and understood that you're condemning the people who would help you feel the most seen and understood like that just makes no sense to me. So like, do a little bit of introspection, look inward, ask yourself why you're so mad about it. And at the end of the day, Everybody is entitled to live their life. My philosophy is like, if you're not hurting anybody else, then by all means, be who you are, do whatever it is that you want to do, but show up with integrity and be a good person. It's not actually that difficult. I actually think it's a lot harder to be hateful. So I really appreciate you helping round out the conversation, as I say, when I'm on my show with that, because I, I think it's really important. I think people are are really in a place of, wanting to find alignment just sort of at the broader sort of stretch of humanity instead of trying to box us all into these things. And those uncomfortable conversations, they're the things that will actually help us understand each other better. Amen, sister. <laughs> Eric, anything you'd like to uh, say as we wrap up? Well, I just want to give Nikki first the opportunity. It's shameless plug time. So okay. where, I know where, <laughs> But where can our audience find your podcast, find you, DM you for all of the questions about all of the things? Yes, as it's, I do have a lot of the answers to most of the things. <laughs> you can find me at, so the podcast website is currently whothefck.com. Who the fuck? I know the website. The FCK. But yeah. I, I want our audience to know when you tell people, say the right, yes. who the fuck? Yes, it's the so the show is who the fuck and new episodes are out every Tuesday. You can subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's actually my name. So it's at Nikki LaCroce. And um, that's where I am on TikTok and Instagram as well. So uh, it's easier probably to find me by my name on social. But then the show itself is who the fuck uh, with an asterisk instead of a U. And you'll see if you're watching the video, you'll see my face on the uh, episode or on the album art. And you can get that on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Nikki, thank you so much. Again, it's like talking to my little sister who I never had and wish I did. Thank Nicole for allowing us to have the time with you tonight. And Please, she's probably like, great, I get to work later. But I will tell you, I will thank her for really being such a massive positive change in my life at the time when I needed it the most. And for really helping me grow, not just through the support as I was going through everything, but for really being a, an even partner in this relationship. Um, it's something that I value more than I could have possibly grasped. So I, I have to give that shameless plug as well. <laughs> Very beautifully said. And and when the two Nicks, Nick and Nick. So that's what that's the swag I'm Oh, I, yes. Today. <laughs> I had a feeling uh, you knew you and I talked about it earlier. So yeah, I can't wait to hear what's in store for Nick and Nick, both personally and professionally. 
So thank you so, so much. I'll turn it over to my friend, Mark. Just a little bit down Valley for me right now. I, I can't thank you enough. It's been an incredible conversation. And, and I love so much how you're always able to kind of put it in an envelope and redirect it of this idea of like, how do we have a dialogue? How do we learn a little bit? And, and I'm at that from a place of caring and love versus this idea of like an othering and putting people in this other box. And, and all too often, I do think it's that those people actually have a wound or something that they're not able to delve into. And that's, they're trying to protect themselves. Uh, if we didn't be one little, one little chink in that wall to break through and, and allow people to be able to do that. That's really why we do this. And, uh, this and totally. Thank you so much for having me, guys. This has been such a blast. I think, thank you. And that's how I'll end. I just want to say thank you so much for our amazing guest, Nikki Approche. And I want to thank Eric DeRosa, my podcast host. And this is Mark Fernandez, co-host of From Survivor to Thriver. And this has been episode 150. And I can't think of a better way to have a round number, Nikki, you wonderful. And I will leave us with these words, as I always do, let's be all be as well as you can. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe to our show and leave us a review. Also, we'd love if you could share this episode with a friend and encourage you to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or email via the links in our show notes. See you next week.